Welcome back to another episode of The Hip. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where every single week I bring you a leader from our sector to discuss some of the biggest challenges in UK housing today. Today on The Hip, I was delighted to be joined by Cal Kay, CFO at Your Housing Group. We talked to Cal about her non-traditional route into finance, how she's developed her leadership skills over the years and her advice and insights for those that are budding leaders in the future, and how she's broke the mold and the attributes to be a successful leaders in today's market. I hope you enjoy the episode, and if you do, I'd ask that you like and subscribe so we can reach as many people as possible. Cal, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. As I've just said offline, I think you are, well, you are the first CFO on our podcast. So no pressure. No pressure. I'll take it in my stride. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, as I always like to start, just do us a, an introduction to yourself, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I'm Cal Kay. I'm Chief Finance Officer at Your Housing Group. Um, not a lifer housing person, if I'm being honest, um, yeah. but I have been in finance for my whole career, which started from when I was 16. Um, I've worked in profit making, private sector early on in my career, moved into not-for-profit um, probably about 20 years ago, um, I've worked in local government and health and places like that, um, and now I'm in housing. I think sometimes you've got to go with where your values are and what makes you tick. Um, I realised quite early on that um, profit for purpose, social value, things like that make me tick, so I didn't yeah. want to make money for shareholders. Um I live in Upper Mill, but I grew up in the inner city Manchester. Um, I came from a social housing background um, in terms of my personal life when I was younger. Lived in a council house, uh, in a council estate in Manchester. Um, and now I live in Oldham. Nice. Love that. And, and I, I always like to ask this question, but obviously everyone seems to fall into housing, but you put that quite articulately that purpose driven is very important to you. How important do you think it is for leaders, but also everyone that's trying to get into our sector to have that purpose drive and that uh, the, the want to help others, I suppose? I think it's got to be part of your fabric. Um, mm. If you're going into any kind of public service, I think the, the key is in the word, it's service. Um, you're not there for your own ego. You're not there to benefit yourself. And yes, you can have a career and yes, you can have aspirations. Of course you can. But ultimately, it's about the person, the people, the community that you're trying to help or serve. Um, so in housing, you know, we work with lots of customers across a vast spectrum. So it could be people looking to buy their houses through shared ownership. It could be people who are desperate for their first home because they're homeless um, if you don't get behind that whole ethos of why it is that we're doing what we're doing, I don't think you'll enjoy the work. Um, and for me, if you enjoy your job, you're not really working, are you? No, it's so true. And, and, and look, everyone I speak to, I think, connects to that purpose. What I would say is, is, is I always think, how do we attract people to that? Because once you get people into housing, they often don't leave. And I know that you've done jobs in housing and then gone back to other um, third sector stuff and then come back. So we've always got you back, but there must be a reason for that. But but what, what is it that you love about housing and, and why is it that you, you, you always return to housing in roles that you've done? I think it's about, it's about that whole going back to me and my youth and okay. remembering what it was like and um you know i had some quite bad experiences and so being able to avoid that in the future working with colleagues to make sure that doesn't happen um you know society has moved on in the last 30 years of course it has so what might have been acceptable then isn't acceptable now of course. But we're always getting better we're always um improving continually whether it's through um tech or whether it's just through empathy and understanding um, and I think as a society, we have shifted as well. There is still a little bit of stigma attached to social housing. We need to just try and break that down. And um, you talked a minute about a uh, minute ago about um, how do we get people into the sector? And I think what we're not very good at is shouting about it early on. So when people are just starting their careers, jobs fairs at high school, jobs fairs at college, getting stalls at universities, you know, this is what it is what it means to be a housing professional. Um, and it's not just necessarily about putting a person in a social house. It's like I say, it's that vast breadth of the things that we do, um, which can even include people buying their own home outright. Um, there's lots of different facets of housing, which I think people don't know about when they're thinking about their careers. 
Yeah, and it's definitely, I mean, I've been in the sector for 15, maybe a bit longer years, and it's definitely changed in that period. So I imagine it's fundamentally changed in 20, 30, 40 years, but the challenge has got more complex, definitely, hasn't it? There's more things to think about. There's more, like you say, there's a lot of uh, challenges in our sector at the moment, and they're things we probably wouldn't have thought about 15 years ago, to be honest, in, in many cases. Um, just for the audience, and we've had Jackie Allen on before, so, so they'll know some of this, but just give us a bit of a helicopter overview of your housing as you see it today. So we are a large Northwest Housing Association. Um, we've come together through various mergers over our history. We operate in Greater Manchester, in the Midlands and in Yorkshire and into Lancashire as well. So we've got quite a big geography. Um, we do things from general needs, affordable housing, right the way through to housing for older people, some extra care schemes as well. We work quite closely with some young people. So we've got a couple of foyers, which we're really proud of. And we have also delivered services for local authorities um, to vulnerable customers too. We are a developer. We are proud of the fact that we are a developer. We've got ambitions to continue to develop, even though purse strings are a bit tight. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we are trying, we're there to build new houses for people who really need it. So we have got an ambitious development programme. Um, and, you know, we're looking to uh, continue to grow and whether that is in the geographies that we're in um, or the provision uh, that we have in our um, locations. Um, yeah, we're just, I think there's there's a lot for your housing to, to think about over the next few years strategically in terms of what it wants to focus on and how it can be the best for its residents. Yeah, I, I was keen to ask you some of this stuff actually, but how important is growth for a housing association in today's world, given how tight purse strings are, given how many challenges we're facing? Growth obviously gives you an economy of scale, doesn't it, to tackle some of these problems. But what are some of the other benefits of being able to grow a housing association and to develop and all the other things that you've just discussed? Well, I think there's, there's a couple of different angles, really. So I think if we just rewind maybe 10 years or so, um, interest rates were really low. There was quite a lot of cash. People were diversifying because that was their risk management strategy. And they were growing in areas where they probably didn't have the expertise and, and spreading themselves quite thin. I think when we talk about growth now, we probably mean, well, certainly in, from my perspective, um, bigger at what we do well and maybe not so much of the peripheral stuff. So more yeah. like consolidating. I think economies of scale, you mentioned that absolutely. I think if you're competing with another RP in your area, it doesn't make sense. And I know we are competitors, but yeah. we are also collaborators. So you know, maybe we do need to think more about how we collaborate with our, our other RPs to have anchor neighbourhoods where you are servicing all that community. You can really build a relationship and you, you do get economies. You get to know that area and you've got impact across the whole spectrum of, of different things within that area. Um, so there could be some swaps going along. I think a lot of RPs are looking at how they might consolidate and, and work in specific geographies. So I think there is an element of us working together to do that. Um and there is also that critical mass. You know, sometimes if you're quite small, you might be seen to be um, bait for a bigger organisation. Uh, and sometimes if you're at a medium-sized organisation, you might be seen to be bait for some of the larger organisations. So there's that, you know, where is the sweet spot where you feel that you can really be economical, um, but you're not too big, you're not too small? Yeah, and, and there is a sweet spot, isn't there? Because actually... Does the customer suffer when it gets too big and and do they not get enough when it's too... It's such a fine art of balancing those two things, isn't it, I think? Yeah, it is, yeah. And, and just... Because obviously now, you know, your house is one of the biggest in the north. Um, how have you found you know, some of those challenges we talk about, like helping customers with the cost of living crisis, being able to balance net zero versus being development versus, because I'm interested from a finance perspective, because actually a lot of people is well documented have turned off development programs because it was the easiest one to turn off. Um, but how do you find balancing all of the things and all of the strategic priorities and also making sure that the money is available to make sure you can continue to keep investing in the stock? That is a really, really tough question. Yeah. And it's one that I have with my board on a regular basis. Oh, and, you know, you do have to make tough choices and you do have to decide what, what your values are and what your strategies are and what you're prepared to put your money where your mouth is. Um, you know, there's been definite increase in demand in terms of existing homes. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about damp and mould. 
um, and the requirements that in terms of maybe previous underinvestment or the fact that we're in the north and it's colder in the north um, and it's wetter. Sure. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> um, so, you know, maybe we should get a bigger share of any damp and mould pot. Um, but you, you're right, there are all these challenges to try and get the properties net zero, fit for the future, um, so it's cheaper for the customers to run and heat their homes, um, balance with development. We, as an organisation, have chosen to continue to invest in some of those areas um, and just taken our margins quite low. And that's quite a bold thing to do. It is. It's not sustainable in the longer term. And, you know, there are cycles in the economy and you would like to think we see an inflation drop. There is talk mm -hmm. of interest rates also potentially dropping in the future. Um, so I'm hoping that it's just a cycle of things and things will hopefully start to get a little bit easier in the years to come. Um, where we can then maybe think about stripping some of those costs back out. Yeah, and, and I don't like to get political, so I don't want to get into politics necessarily, but there's going to need to be some funding here, isn't there? There's a gap that we need to plug within development, new homes, net zero carbon <laughs> and damper mould. There's going to need to be some level of funding that's going to be able to support our sector to get all of these priorities delivered, surely? Surely. I mean, yes. I mean, I don't want to get political either. And, you know, in terms of building homes, they're not cheap to build and you've got to have the cash flow to be able to do that, which is why it's an easy thing to turn off if cash is, is a scarce resource. Um, but, you know, some of the policies that are in place don't help in terms of house, well, house builders, RPs as house builders. You know, we can get grant levels, but they're very small in comparison to what they might have been years ago. Um, we are forced to sell houses through right to buy and you don't generate the same kind of returns. Um, you know, some of the stock is quite old and so does need a lot of investment. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a really difficult one to try and square that circle because you need to make sure you're investing in your properties so that they're fit for purpose. Um, and we know there is a housing shortage. There is a um, shortage of availability of land. So, you know, that doesn't help either. And again, we're all competing. Even the public sector is competing, competing with itself. And we're on the outside trying to compete with them and with house builders. Um, you know, whether something could be done centrally to, to be able to divvy out things in a different way, um, you know, working in a more, dare I say it, collaborative way with government. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's all about the, the, the good of the economy and the good for the public, you know. The, yeah. Sometimes short-termism that, that is a part of politics doesn't help with a long-term business like housing. Yeah, and look, I, I was here in the last recession when it was, a, you know, the, the 28, 2008 one, and building back was the way we got out of it. And so actually developing new housing solves two or three different agendas, to be honest. But anyway, we'll, we'll get there, I'm sure. Um, when I came on this podcast, I asked my team to tell me a little bit about you, and I know you've dealt with some of my team over the years, and they said, what a fantastic leader you are, and that you're not, and, and I think you said this to yourself, non-traditional necessarily in the way that you do things, but... I joked with you offline about being in finance and having the people skills and leadership skills, but we know that you do have that. How have you honed them skills over the years and how would you sort of describe yourself as a leader now you've done all these different roles in the, in the last 10, 20 years? Um, so I think it's a tale of two halves, really. <laughs> right, so, <fine. laughs> when I, my first director role, and I'm going back a fair bit, um, if you would have asked people about my management style, if you were to put process and performance on one side and people on the other, yep. everyone would have said I was 100% all about the process and right. performance and um, not very considerate about people. Um, but it's something that you learn quite quickly when you are leading people, that mm -hmm. people are important. Um, you do a lot of work through people, with people, and we could, we all we are all people we come to work to do a really good job um you know fast forward another 10 years um i'm kind of half and half now because yeah it's important that we get things done you know finance is quite deadline driven um you know we've got to make sure we get things done we've got to make sure there's enough money in the bank to do the things we need to do of course um but we are still people we've all got ambition drive emotions personal lives families um being considerate to all of those things means that colleagues are more likely to go that extra mile for you because you're willing to go that extra mile for them. So it's absolutely a give and take relationship. Um, I build really good relationships with my direct reports. 
Um, I'm, I'm pausing there and a little bit hesitant because if you'd have asked me the question a couple of years ago, I would also say I build really good relationships with my wider team. Right. I have found since COVID that is more difficult because you mm. don't see people every day. Um, when I was director of finance at Great Places, I could walk the floor of and course. spend an hour chatting to people, having a cup of tea, having a laugh. I knew everyone's partners' names, the kids, where they went on holiday. Um, I'll be honest, at your housing group, there isn't that same because we're hybrid, we're agile, um, we're not all in the office at the same time, and it's pockets of teams. It's, it's very different to build the same kind of relationships. So, yeah, it's it's something I keep working at it and keep trying to find new ways to develop how you how you work with people. Yeah, and I agree. I think in a straight line, dealing with your own team's easy, but when we were working from home all the time, I struggled with the, like you said, the, the collaborative teams and being able to collaborate on projects and stuff. So I agree with that. And I think it's coming back a little bit. I do think it's getting a little bit easier and people are wanting to see people in person a bit more than they did. Um, but like, how do you balance? Because obviously, like you said, finance is very target driven, very deadline driven, and can be sometimes quite a thankless task in some of the things and some of the projects that you have to do. Um, but it's all necessary. How do you keep productivity high whilst keeping morale of your team high? And how do you make sure you keep a good balance of the two whilst navigating what is a very challenging world at the moment financially? <laughs> I think, um, you know, part of what we do is a science and part is an art. That, mm -hmm. you know, when we do financial statements, management accounts, it's backward looking, it's quite scientific, and you can try and yeah. run that a bit like a machine, actually. Um, it's the it's the value add stuff that we do, the art stuff, the forecasting, the options appraisals, the partnering with the business. That's where you need somebody with the you know that flair about them and good communication skills. So sometimes it's about finding the right team members to go with the right tasks because certain people will be more attuned to one part or the other part. Yeah. Um, keep, keep, keeping people motivated. I like to think of us as plants, you know. Um, some of us have strong roots. Some of us have shallow, deep or deep roots. Uh, we can move about. Sometimes, but if you put us in the wrong soil, we will flounder and die. Um, yep. So you know, find the right soil for your people. Um, and if they don't look like they are thriving, move them. Um, sometimes we get bound by HR rules. You can't do this, and you can. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you can. You can. You know. Actually, why don't I give you that project this time? It's not in your job description, but you know, let's let's give it a go and try and test things with people. Um, and ultimately, it goes back to knowing your people. So if you know what makes them tick, you know that 80% good enough is all right for that piece of work. Go and spend time with your kids tonight. Having those conversations and being grown up about it, I think, is, is something that works well for me. Um, and because we are mature individuals, you know, we all know which are the movable deadlines and which are the softer deadlines. Yeah. We work to that, of course we do. Um, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is more... There's more of a priority in going seeing your kids play football that, that night rather than working on a report. That's absolutely fine, yeah. you know, um, and you've got to help people find that balance. Because sometimes and you can get too stuck into the detail that you forget to step back and have a look. Yeah, I agree with that. But I also was going to ask as well, if I'm a, I don't know, plumber, for example, and I'm working around Warrington for your housing, I'm seeing the end result of my work. How do you yes. connect your team to that social purpose and that ability to see all these reports do add up to the bigger things that happen in the organization and they're having a real impact to residents lives because if i'm a tradesperson and i'm going into a, a home i can see the impact i'm making but if i'm a financial controller or a financial analyst i'm not necessarily seeing that my work's contributing to the wider picture how do you connect the two um, and again, sometimes it's about knowing your people and we, we, this is our background. This is what we're trained to do. So we can often connect to a business through different means rather than touching and feeling. Whereas a plumber or electrician is likely to be a tactile kind of person. Um, but you're right. And, you know, going back again, pre COVID, you would get everyone out for a day and say, right, let's go to a scheme. Let's do a bit of clean and clear or let's go to a void or whatever it might be. Um, I think we need to do a bit more of that. Um, I will hold my hands up and say, I haven't done that with the team yet at YHG. Um, I will also hold my hands up and, and say, with shame, I haven't been out to see a lot of our properties yet either. Um, but it's something on my to-do list. It's something that I encourage people to do. Um, yeah. I went to see a, the, one of the foyers last week and it was brilliant. Really connected to the work. Um, the kids that are there are similar ages to my kids. So I say kids, the young people. 
similar ages to my young people um <laughs> and you know it does make you connect with that with with that service because i think gosh what would happen if one of my children didn't have somewhere to live and you know didn't have the loving home that they have and this is where those those young people go so you're right there is that connection back to why we do what we do and it's really important to do that and i think it's my job to make sure people have got the freedoms to connect to the work as often as they need to yeah, of course. We do the same thing. I mean, recruitment gets a bad a bad name, but uh, but actually connecting our staff to the communities that we help to source candidates for has been the biggest thing we could have done. Out of everything that we've implemented, actually going out once a month and doing something in the community has connected them to the purpose bit of what we're doing it for. And I think that's that's so important because sometimes you can get stuck behind the actually i'm just doing my job and i go home and the thing just continues on repeat how have you managed to two twofold now you've just mentioned about covid but since covid how have you managed to measure the success of your teams um and has it become more difficult based on covid and not being in and around people as much as you were because i struggle at the moment i'm like I, I feel less visible of what's going on in my business how have you found that and how do you measure effectiveness and expectations of the output of your team? See, I can give you a very traditional CFO answer and I can give you an LK answer. So give I us a LK you... answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously I'm going to say things like staff satisfaction and reduction yeah, in turnover. Of course, you've got your measurables and we all <laughs> love data, don't we? We are a data-driven organisation. But you can tell by how things feel. Um you know, when I when I walk around Google House, which is the the base that we have in Warrington at Birchwood, um, you can tell that people are happy, they are comfortable. People chat to you, um, people chat to each other. There is a nice vibe. You can't measure that. You can't empirically say it's a great place to work, but you can feel that it's a great place to work. So I think some of that, as a leader, is really important because you can pick up the vibe of the organisation through just being with people um, and then you back it up with the data through the metrics don't you of course you do um, course. i think sometimes it's the and i go back to the value add the, those things that people do that they don't actually have to do i think is a testament to people being mm -hmm. highly motivated and wanting to do a great job and loving the organization that they work for yeah i agree and, and what about the model like have you found the recipe for success now on how it works within your team and i suppose wider on the, the 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 your housing group thing have you found the recipe for success now or are you still searching for the right answers in terms of you know it could be hybrid working it could be effectiveness it could be how you're getting on with tenants but it's a real balancing act isn't it and I, and I certainly think um since covid it's been more difficult to like you say put your finger on things it's a look and feel job sometimes yeah, I don't think I have one recipe for success. Okay. I think I have a couple of recipes that equally make nice cakes. Um, <laughs> but always looking to continually improve, always. I don't think anyone should ever really just think, I've found the recipe and I'm going to stick with that for forever. Um, because times change, people change, needs change. Um, you know, I think being adaptable is probably the best tool in your toolbox. So coming out of COVID, you know, there are longer term impacts that people have, certainly around confidence, um, expectations, things like that. And it's affected everyone differently. Some people, when lockdown was abolished, went out and, and it was great. Some people didn't. They stayed in the houses and they were a bit reserved. Um, some people found their work life balance through COVID. Others completely didn't. Um, so you've got to get underneath. I think it's going back to something I've said already probably twice on this chat is knowing the people, knowing your people as mm -hmm. best you can to be able to help them grow and thrive in whatever it is that they want to do. Um, yeah. yeah, that's good. And, and you talked about it as soil. I talk about it as tribes, like finding your right tribe. How, how important is it to be part of the right exec team as well? So what I'm trying to understand there is what are the symptoms of a thriving board of exec in a housing association? And how do you know you've found the right people for you? Because like you say, different soils, different environments, they're all, not every environment fits every person. How do you know that you've got a highly successful, high performing board of directors? And how does that make you perform when you know you're amongst the right sorts of leadership profiles? Yeah, so I think certainly the exec team at 
YHG is relatively new as a team. So you yeah. mentioned Jackie was on um, one of your podcasts earlier. Um, you know, a couple of years as chief executive YHG. I've only been in post seven months. And mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of exec directors who have been there for a while. And we've got two new exec joining. Well, one joined in April, one joins in July. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be a new team farming. And um, so, you know, it's it's going to be very interesting. I'm really looking forward to having a, a bigger executive team. Um, yep. I do think that we exhibit some of the behaviours that you would expect of a high performing executive team. We are happy to call each other out with respect. We are happy to disagree on things. We are happy to debate, challenge. Um, but we all, all of us, we come out of the room and we are united front. We agree the decision and we all live by that decision. Um, I've seen that firsthand on a number of occasions. Um, everyone's willing to get involved. In fact, I'll give you a really good example. Um, I went through some stress testing with the exec leadership team and the senior leadership team. And when I've done it in the past, it's been quite a quiet conversation, finance heavy, bit taxing. Um, yeah. It wasn't like that. Everyone was engaged. What about this, Cal? What about that, Cal? People are happy to jump into a conversation that isn't their specialist subject and happy to ask questions and say, I don't know the answer, but what does that mean? I think that is a key to success. So there's no egos in the room. We're all, you know, we're all part of a bigger machine and, you know, we all respect each other in that way. Yeah, and obviously you said I had Jackie on the podcast. It felt collaborative. I'm presuming that's how you feel. The um, the big thing for me though is that can, you can still be collaborative whilst challenging each other. Do you know? And I sometimes think that sometimes the number one role in an organisation it can be a bit of a yeah. We'll just go with their direction and actually pushing back is is the way to create the right the right atmosphere. And also you've got to reconnect it to the purpose right that you're doing this for the customer not for you or for, for jackie you're doing it for the customer so the right decision is the right decision whoever comes up with the idea i suppose yeah. um and, and just in terms of kind of like your career i know we touched on it earlier but you haven't necessarily you've taken you've broke the mold in terms of how that's been what what do you believe are some of the attributes that have helped you have the confidence to you've definitely got individuality you've definitely got confidence but You'd rather be unique like you are, but how have you found the confidence to just be yourself? And, you know, you are very authentic and you are very much yourself, but how have you managed to come up with that? Because it wouldn't have been that like that 10, 12, 15 years ago, I'm sure. No, it's been, it's been in the making for a long time. <laughs> um, it, it's been really challenging, actually. And, you know, when I go back to some of my earlier career, um, you know, I was relatively young, to be an FD. And, you know, I, I started young. I started work at 16. So by the time I was 30, I had 14 years experience against people who had probably only been working for a few years, you know. Um, so being a young FD came with its challenges. People didn't often take me seriously. If it was dressed out Friday, I got mistaken for the tea lady. Um, you know, things like that. Um, you've got to be able to rise above all of that. You've got to be able to think, who am I? What are my values? What am I willing to stand for? And what am I willing to not stand for and be true to yourself? Um, so, you know, being a woman of colour has been quite a challenge in my career. And you know, there aren't very many executives, even now, all this time later, um, that are women of colour. We, it, we're still having to fight the fight. Um, I think the gender balance has definitely shifted. Certainly in housing, loads of chief execs coming through females. It's great. Um, but, you know, there's still work to do, isn't there, in terms of uh, BME diversity. And, you know, by doing things like this, I can I can show people that it's possible if I can do it. 16-year-old Cal from Garton who left school with no GCSE. <laughs> Come on, if I can do it. Anyone can do it. You've got to have fire in your belly. I think that's the only one ingredient that you've got to have, fire in your belly. But, but how do we – and I love that story, right? And, like – you must be super proud of what you've achieved in your career already and there's, there's lots left of it but how do we inspire the next generation to have the confidence especially women of color or just women to put themselves forward and pluck up the courage to put themselves forward for opportunities to apply for because like I, i've read loads about this recently and the amount of women that will look at a job description and say can't do that 
So therefore they don't apply. And we get it in the recruitment world where mm, I'm not sure I could do all of those things on that job description. Well, a man would say I can do all of them things and, and they may not be able to. So how do we break the mold to inspire people or give them confidence to apply for things and to try new things? Because otherwise we are going to sit here in 20 years time, in my opinion, and talk about the same things. We haven't got mm. enough women on board. Yeah, I agree. We've changed the balance of that. Totally agree. But women of color, that's not just going to happen because we put a spotlight on it for two or three years. That's going to be a constant battle to continue to try and de develop leaders because my issue is having looked at the overall recruitment landscape, we're going to have to hire people out of sector. We're going to have to develop our own talent. We're going to have to give opportunities to people that don't have all the skills on the job description. There's a hundred things that we're going to have to be able to do. To, and that's a systemic behavioral change that's going to have to happen. It's not a overnight thing, but What's your advice for those that are thinking, I'd love to hit this, or these are my aspirations that are just lacking in that confidence to do it? I think there are a few things in that question. I think for individuals who might be listening to this and thinking, you know, I want to take that next step and, and what do I do? It's about having that longer term plan of where you want to be and the stepping stones that you need to, to step on to get there and not being afraid to try because you can always fail and try something else. Um, I know it can be really, really daunting going for a career move, especially if you've got mortgage, kids, and you know that risk then of what if I'm unemployed and I can't make, you know, can't make thing, make ends meet. Um, but you've got to back yourself. You know, if you've got that in you and you think, you know, I can do a really good job of that, you've got to put your hat, hat in the ring and go for it. Um, and you know, for employers, we've got to get better at saying for a role, these are absolute musts. But all the rest of it, you can learn on the job and we'll provide training and this is what you're aspiring to. We, we're quite, and you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. You know, this is the job description. You will have these skills and you will have this knowledge. I mean, you don't actually have to have all of it yeah. to start with. Um, and so I think there's something definitely on us as employers in terms of breaking some of that down so it's accessible for people who think they might not have everything on that list. Um, the... The women and men thing, you, you are right. We do have it within us. We, we're quite reserved around promoting ourselves, backing ourselves, thinking, I can do that. Give me a chance. Um, we just need to make it more acceptable and more common that we, and, you know, being visible as a female leader, hopefully we then inspire others to, to think, yes, I can do that. I can I can be the next whatever it might be. Um, and we've just got to keep encouraging each other. Yeah, I agree. I also think it's, a you know, in board meetings and in from a board level perspective, we've got to encourage more voices in the room rather than it being one voice. And, you know, I've been guilty of that in meetings previously where you do all the talking and, and actually it's about getting everyone else's, you might not have the confidence to shout their idea. You've got to try and bring people in on the conversation. And that's the, the most key thing. How, how do we solve the educational piece that sits behind some of our issues in recruiting people of color to our organizations? Because clearly, we talk about unconscious bias, we talk about some training and stuff like that. And I think that's that's helping to a certain degree, but what are some of the other things we can do to educate our teams on how to make sure that they're being fair and inclusive in the recruitment process and how they're making sure that they're giving opportunities to others and so that our businesses are representative of our community because at the minute they're not. I mean, we can kid ourselves that they are, but they're not. So <laughs> we're doing our best, aren't we? But they're just, we're not there yet. Yeah, and yeah, it's a really difficult question, actually, because it's two sides of the same coin. There's what can we do as recruiters, managers, employers, but there's what can communities do to, to change as well. So, you know, when I grew up, there was no females in my family that had an office job. None. Um, and I'm just, I'm thinking back now, and I don't think, I think I'm the only one still who <laughs> has an office job. <laughs> yeah. So culturally, you know, how do, some of it's got to come from communities. How do we get into communities to say there are there are latent skills in there that we just need to tap into? You've all got it within you with a little bit of training, a little bit of development. You could do this, this or this. Um, we've got to try and find some of those people. Um, and then, you, you know, we talk about accessibility. There might be pockets of society that have got those latent skills. But they're just not online. They're not on LinkedIn. They're not on Indeed. So they're not going to see the adverts. Of so course. we've got to try and get into those communities. 
Um, and I think, you know, housing officers do that to a degree. Um, community safety workers do that. Um, I know health professionals and police do that. But as a society, do we ever try and then tap that potential or go in as a, as a cohort of services to say, right, let's do something in this community? Um, I think there is definitely something about how we collaborate, not just within housing, but within health, education, police, because they're all yeah. interlinked. You know, you've got to have the right education, you've got to have the right housing, you've got to have a safe community, you need to be healthy and well. Um, so there's definitely something in that, but where the answer is, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. We've just got to keep keep, keep on keeping the fight going. And, and we, we do loads in the community and it doesn't even feel, I'm just being honest, it doesn't feel like, you know, the team are out today doing a session at Calico speaking to their, their customers and it's great but it doesn't feel like you're even a drop in the ocean to fixing them. <laughs> like, you know, it's going to need that times a million to get anywhere near tapping some of that potential. But what um, what about some of the struggles? Because clearly I speak to a, a lot of women that are coming through their careers and like, I just don't know if I want to go to the next level because I've got studies, I've got children, I've got, <laughs> you know, all these things. But our sector's great for that, right? Like in terms of like, we're very flexible, we can be very good at round agile work and et cetera, et cetera, which can support better than some of the private sector organizations, certainly for people to have families and have flexibility and not work nine till five in a traditional way. But what have been some of the struggles you found and how have you managed to push through to get to the level you are today? Because you've obviously done all these things, but you've still managed to come out as a CFO of an organization and you must, you must look back on that and think, yeah, I've gone through some adversity to get to this point, but how did you push through the the, 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 the hurdles that came up and, and how would other people push through those hurdles to make sure they don't give up on their career because they want a family or they don't give up on their career because they're a woman? And how do you push through the adversity? I think it's about being really focused, really determined and knowing what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've always had like a 10 year plan so even from being quite young, um, <laughs> I had a 10-year plan and my plan was to be qualified, what is to be a qualified accountant. Um, and life does happen. Yeah, I got married. Yeah, I had a, a little girl. Um, yeah, I moved jobs. I didn't get any study leave, didn't get any uh, financial support, um, full-time job, mortgage. Um, you know, I put my daughter to bed, hit the books. I couldn't afford night school. So self-studied, um, determined, focused. Didn't go out with any friends. Didn't go out drinking. Didn't for a long, long time. Got divorced, got remarried, had another couple of kids. Still hitting the books every night. Took me 10 years. 28 when I qualified. Um, and it was an absolute slog. But it, was, it was what I wanted. That was what was driving me. I, you know, other people have different ones and I don't judge anybody. We all have the same 24 hours in the day and it's how we carve it up. Um as I was getting through my career and, and taking promotions, it wasn't sustainable. Um, trying to drop off, get to work, pick up, get home. There's not enough hours in the day. There isn't, because if you're in a nine to five job, you can't yeah. do it, you can't. Um, I was really, really fortunate that my husband was really supportive of me. He decided to give up work, do the school runs, sort the kids out, bath them, clean them, take them to parties. My career managed to then take off from there. Um, not everybody has those same opportunities. So I always look for the positive. I had a really supportive partner um, and I was very focused and he was bought into me as in terms of that career path. Yeah. Um, but I don't compromise, you know, at the weekends. I'm a I'm, I'm family, family lady. I like to do stuff with the kids. And I mean, they're a bit more grown up now, so they probably don't want to do anything with mum. But yeah, you, you, you choose what you are willing to compromise on and you choose what is important to you. And and you make sacrifices if you have to. Um, I do think sometimes if you're not willing to sacrifice for your goal, it's not really a goal. And I can say that wholeheartedly because I'm trying desperately to lose weight. I've got a last few kilograms to drop. I'm not committed enough because I don't stick to my diet. Yeah, yeah, I've only yeah. got myself to blame. Yeah, meant to that. <laughs> yeah you, can, you can only focus on one thing at once. If something's going on in your life that needs your focus, that's what needs your focus. Um, but you know, if something is important to you, you have to give you have to give it some of your time. It's like anything, isn't it? Even a hobby. There's sacrifices. There's pros and cons to everything that you decide to mm -hmm. do. But if you were to go back and talk to your twenty or eight year old self, would you change anything? Would there be any advice that you'd do things differently, or, or are you satisfied with how you how that journey develops? Because I'm sure there's people going to listen to this 
that are sat in finance functions in other businesses thinking, I could do that, I could set my mind to it. But what would be some of the advice you'd give to people that do want to push and do that? I know you said the sacrifices, but what were some of the other things that have got you through some of the leadership ranks? Because not everyone can be a CFO, naturally. But what were some of the things that you had to upskill yourself in that period to become a leader that you are today? Um, I would say take every opportunity with an open mind. Right. Um, I mean, I've got quite a strong character, um, people mean people think that because I've got a strong character, I am unbending. That's not, that's not true. I actually do flex quite a lot. I take on board people's feedback. I reflect and I mull it over. Um, I just have quite a strong character in a way about me. I think if I was giving myself advice, it would be never compromise on who you are. Um, you know, live by your values. Let them be your moral compass. Um, and if you're in a situation that doesn't fit with that, exit. I stayed in roles because of the perception of what it would look like on my CV, rather than because of how it made me feel. And actually I should have left that organization um, because it didn't make me feel very good. Um, so, you know, that's what I would probably say to anybody who's thinking about how they can reach their goals. Be true to yourself, work out what it is that's making you tick, find little touch points and how you can incrementally do it. It didn't happen from no job, no GCSE to CFO. It happened through 30 years of hard graft. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. That's what I put in. Yeah. yeah. And I want to talk to you about that because obviously you've done your exams and you didn't do it a traditional way in terms of like you didn't do it the way that most do. So that's good. Um, but there's a lot of talk about professionalization of our sector. And I'm torn on this and I've got pros and cons coming out of my head about how that will impact people coming into our sector. But what's your view on it? A, the professionalisation, because you can't be an accountant without having a, you know, ACCA or, or a qualification. So I like it from that perspective. I do worry about how it will restrict people from coming into our sector or impact those that are already in the sector that do a great job that might now need to go and get a qualification. But where do you stand on it? Because as a, as a finance professional, it's essential. So why should it not be in housing is, is my trail of thought. But what's, what, what's your views on, on that as a, as a thing? Yeah, so this is my personal view and not the view of any organisation that I'm yeah. really careful for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got a slightly different view about finance, if I'm being honest. Um, I am qualified and, you know, back in those days, if you didn't have the letters, you couldn't get the job. I have hired people who haven't had the qualifications, but they've got tons of experience yeah. and they are probably just as good, if not better than some people who have the qualifications. So I think just having the letters doesn't make you more professional. It's how you behave. It's how you interact with your customers. And as finance professionals, our customers are colleagues as well as tenants, as well as board members and funders. Yeah. Um, so I think, yes, there is something about professionalisation, absolutely. But it's that softer side of it, not necessarily the, the technical bits of it. Um, and I do think you run the risk of them potentially alienating and dividing people because it'll be those that are qualified and those that are not. Um, I am a firm believer of education. You know, I've worked in FE. Um, it is, education is really, really important, but I don't think it's the be all and end all of everything. It doesn't necessarily make you a better accountant just because you've got the letters. It's about how you, how you interact with your customers. So yes, professionalise. Yes, probably keep it to some of the customer focused bits. Um, I'm not too sure what the objective is of it, to be honest. No, is it I, implying I, that we're not currently professional in the way that we do the things that we do? I don't know. And, and the bit that I struggle with it is, I speak to people all the time, like, look, if I have to go and get a qualification at this part in my career to do what I've been doing for 30 years, I'm not gonna go and do it. So we can't lose those great people just because they don't wanna go and get a certificate. I do see some merit on how do we upskill i don't like professionalize the word but upskill people when they come into our organization so that they're continuously on a learning journey i'm continuously learning i'm sure you are so development's a different story to professionalization but i do sit on the fence of, with it where i think it's going to turn more people off than it's going to turn on to the sector by professionalizing it because we're already struggling if you think about housing officers as a role it's a great role it's an absolute key part of any organization and it's a tough role <laughs> If you then add a qualification into the mix of that, I think it'll mean that we won't be able to recruit people in that in that part of the sector. Um, so, loads yeah. of food. I think thought. there's something in that. I do, and you know, I don't for one minute believe that um, having 
some kind of professionalism around what you do is important. But it's that, does it need to be at entry level? You know, you can have people coming into the finance team who've never worked in finance before and they can learn the ropes and then decide whether it's for them. And I think there ought to be something equivalent in housing, definitely. And certainly in the trades as well, you know, that's why you have apprenticeship routes and things like that to people try before they buy. But I think, you know, probably as you're moving up the ranks, some of that professionalisation is probably just more of a general management overview of how a business works. Of course. Yeah. I think everyone should get that. Um, you know, we're probably guilty as anybody in terms of promoting people without giving them the, the relevant skills. You could be a great accountant, doesn't mean you're a great manager. You could yeah. be a great housing officer, doesn't mean you're a great manager. So that, that professionalisation, I think, needs to fit all elements of the housing rather than just the housing officer. Yeah, I agree. And, and I also wonder, do we, you talked about collaboration between organisations, and I do think we're getting better, I do. But I'd love to see more mentorship in the in the sector and more people, you know, sitting with you, an audience at Cal. You can see it now in the lights. But, you know, just to give you some advice on how you found the sector and, like, there's so many mentoring opportunities where people can learn and be inspired by other leaders in our sector that we probably miss a trick on doing sometimes, I think. Yeah, I agree. And, you know... Mentoring, I think, can be quite useful as well on a one-to-one -one basis because sometimes mm -hmm. people might not speak up if it's a round table. Um, and, you know, again, it's about relationship building. You've got to be able to understand what that person's doing, how they feel, what are their barriers, help them overcome them. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And I also like the cross-company thing as well because if you've worked in one organisation all your life, you kind of, you're in that 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 flavor and that's all you ever hear but actually it's lovely to hear from other organizations why i love doing the podcast because everyone's got a different view and everyone's got a different opinion and that's good it's healthy it's great yeah, yes yeah. diversity of thought is yeah, like the wow. best yeah. it yeah. is of course it is um, and, and as we just wrap up now i just wanted to find out kind of from your perspective personally from your career perspective what are you still keen to achieve in your career and what you know seven eight months in at your housing did you say yeah. so like what what are you excited to see happen in the next you know two or three years at your housing as well what are some of the exciting things that you're looking forward to um so i'll answer the second part first okay so um a couple of years at your housing i think it's not without its challenges at the moment um i've mentioned earlier didn't i about putting extra resources in for things like damp and mold and um, investing in properties and things like that and we are continuing to develop so for me if we can get to a more financially sustainable position in the medium term where our margins are increasing that I think would fill me with so much joy um that's the the, the CFO in me coming out the little nerd in me coming out um you know increasing margins obviously uh, ability to attract really great funding and um, we've got a big funding round due in probably a three-year horizon so successful execution of that I think would be great um but just in terms of me and my career and where I want to go, I'm not done yet. I'm still learning. I'm still evolving. I think I've got loads to give. Um, I'd like to break the mould. I'd like to help lots of other people also break the mould and the glass ceiling that is around. Um, I'd like to aim for a chief exec role. I think I've got it in me to do that. Um, I think I've got a bit of learning to do. Um, my portfolio is a little bit broader in this role than it was in my previous um, because I, I have development as well uh, that reports into me. But I think, you know, as opportunities present themselves in the next few years, I'll be knocking on Jackie's door to say, let me have a go at that. Let me have yeah. a go at that. Uh, <laughs> she'll be sick of the sight of me saying, let me have a go at that. Um, but, you know, there are things I want to have a go at just to see whether or not I can dip my toe into different waters and whether or not I can be effective in those areas too. Um, but, yeah, with the, with the aim of being a CEO one day. Amazing. What a nice way to end. I think, I mean, for people that might have questions, because you're the first CFO <laughs> on the podcast, um, are people happy to, are you happy for people to reach out to you on LinkedIn if they want to connect and stuff? Because from the sector, I think, I think honestly, like I, certainly from my perspective, and I knew that this coming in, but you're a, you're a fabulous leader in our sector. And I love how you're very, very candid around your views on things. And you talked about kind of, being unbendable i think you are bendable i just think that you um you you've got a really set way on on the way that you think things should be and, and i like that and i think um your housing of building a great team and i'm excited to see what the next three or four years look like and obviously we're, we're in a challenging part of the sector and so it'll be interesting to see how you navigate the choppy waters because finance is going to be a really big part of all housing associations in the next 
two or three years because we've got to try and find a way of funding all these things that we're trying to do so but thank you so much for giving up your time and i'm sure everyone's gonna get loads of valuable insights from that session yeah well thank you for having me cheers carl okay see ya thank you for listening to another episode of the hip if you'd like to hear more from us please be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform We are also running a 30-minute clinic free of charge to any clients that want to recruit in a more inclusive way. For more information, please reach out to us on our website, andersonjames.com.